Classic Rock Beagle. Welcome to the Annals of the Classic Rock Beagle. I'm Dobbs and this is Moser. We review music and topics from the classic rock era. We're finishing up the best of the 60s. So without further ado, we'll... What? Well, what do you suggest? Okay, let's try it. Ah, beautiful day in it, Moser. This is the light. Oh, and at number five, a song with the title that we've already seen on this list. After Woodstock, at the height of his success, Sylvester Stewart, a.k.a. Sly Stone, took a step back to reevaluate things. In the meantime, Sernois et la Famille Pierre released the greatest hits compilation, which included a song called Thank You. And just to distinguish it from my number seven song, they called it Thank You, Wep uh, Gobbledygook Gibberish. A peppy melody that develops over the course of the song. Sly is very good at writing melodies. That's right, this is a one chord song. Give the song another listen and show me where the chord changes. I just put an A minus up there, obviously not due to any advanced music theory, but it just laid the groundwork for a very energetic funk song. Larry Graham, the man, the myth, the legend. I first discovered Graham through this song. That's a nice song, Larry, but an embarrassing outfit. Anyways, while the playing from the rest of the band is really good, this is all about the slap bass. With this bass line, Larry Graham took the funk James Brown and Funkadelic were doing at the time up to the next level. This is a song that one cannot not move one's feet to. Interesting. One chord, one tempo, and yet there's movement. The horns come in and out, there's a splash of harmony in the chorus, and the instrumental interlude contributes to the development of the song. Yeah, the playing was better than the sound. Interesting, Sly's other hit from this compilation, Hot Fun in the Summertime, might have been his best timber. Thank you for letting me be myself again with a funky beat. A fun vibe from the band that just released Hot Fun in the Summertime. These lyrics are unfocused, but there are clear overtones of racial strife throughout. If you can nail a groove, you can ride it. Sly's technique of high pitch strumming every other measure would be copied until disco hit its peak almost a decade later. Thank you, Sly's version, is an elite song. Next. Cream decided in May of 1968 that they had had enough infighting and decided to split up after the U.S. tour. And then they went into the studio to record one last album and made one last tour. That last album called Goodbye included only three new songs, including our number four song. The 
this is a clever melody and I love the double track on the third line of each verse. minor ninth at the end of each verse is actually the tonic. I never would have guessed. And the shift to D major for the bridge is brilliant. In fact, in my opinion, the bridge is one of the best pieces of music in the decade. I wish George and Eric had collaborated more. Ginger Baker was absolutely the perfect drummer for Queen. On Badge, he and Jack Bruce elevated the song with their virtuoso playing skill. And what George and Eric did certainly was accentuated by Jack and Ginger. Oh my gosh, where do I start? The verses themselves could have been more than satisfying, but the bridge and stark contrast to the rest of the song and the build throughout the bridge from the initial George's guitar to the full band with vocal to Eric's amazing solo. Wow, and let's not sleep on that stark ending. I can listen to this song all day. We'll start with the guitar sounds of George and Eric. Some of the most advanced guitar sounds of the decade. But I want to focus on a couple little touches. The piano would seem unnecessary on paper. The guitar gave plenty for us to chew on, but it was actually a great addition. And adding the strings at the end was also brilliant. I'm glad it was there, and I'm equally glad that it didn't come in before the last verse. That last detail helps the A-plus in the form section as well. In terms of substance, nada. But the lyrics are very artfully crafted. Fascinating lyrics, really. I couldn't tell you what they were about. Oh, by the way, the title Badge came about because Eric misread George's note about the bridge of the song. One of the great soundscapes, not only in the 60s, but in rock history. Badge is a masterfully crafted song and a fitting finale for one of the great bands in rock history. Badge is in the elite category. Next. Hendrix, Page, Townsend, Green, Clapton, Richards. It's 1969 and the electric guitar has completely replaced horns as rock sweeps jazz aside, ushering in a new age, uh, except for blood, sweat, and tears. And Sly again. You get the joke. Horns dominated the first half of the 20th century. They weren't going away without a fight. All those kids who learned trumpet in the 50s weren't just going to give up music. Enter 1969's biggest new band, Chicago Transit Authority. Their debut album won the Grammy for Best New Artist and a lawsuit to stop using the band name. Hence Chicago going forward. To me, the melody is what stands out. One thing about Chicago, before they became, you know, Chicago. Sorry, Todd, this one's on David Foster, not Peter Cetera. Anyways, one of the things I love about Chicago was vocalists Peter Cetera, Terry Kath, and Robert Lamb 
They brought very distinctive and capable vocals to Chicago. On beginnings, Lamb's smooth vocal is perfect for the sensual melody. Take two. This song's the reason why uh, I'm using guitar for the second part. This is this part's a lot easier for me to do on guitar than, than keyboards. The intro. The verses are a symphony in sevenths. They're grounded on the key of A major seventh, but develops organically in two progressions going back and forth. Now this is helped because of the coda, which is an A, G, F, G progression. Very different, although like the earlier part of the song is grounded in the key of A. The song has really good energy. Danny Seraphine is an underrated drummer. The superbly crafted song with instrumental parts to mix things up. The musicianship is incredible. Chicago on the game has almost unmatched musicianship. It really shows on this song. You have the rhythm provided by Terry Kath's guitar with Peter Terror and Danny Seraphine. But here, most obviously, it's in the horns, led by trombonist Jimmy Pankow and trumpist, trumpetist Lee Lochnane. We're both still in the band, up by the way. Lyrics. For substance, give it a C plus. For style, give it an A. Let's split the difference. When I did my list in 2012, this was my number one song of the 60s. It came awfully close in 2021 as well. Beginnings is an elite song. Next. Guitarist Jules Alexander and singer Terry Kirkman met in 1962 while Alexander was in the Navy. They formed a friendship and eventually a musical bond. They started playing together in 1964 with various bands with millions of people blowing through, such as Frank Zappa, David Crosby, and Cass Elliot. In 1965, they formed the association with almost the full classic lineup. Alexander left the group in 1967, replaced by the great Larry Ramos. Their first two singles with this lineup were perhaps two most famous songs, Windy and our number two song. Vocalist Terry Kirkman and Larry Ramos sing the melody on this song, written by the Idrisi Brothers. 
They did a very good job on this song, but the true star is that timeless melodic line. There are only two parts of the song, verse and chorus. We'll talk about this more when we get to the form section. But there is an inobtrusive complexity to these chords. It not only gives a melodic line boundless room to play, but equally important is what it doesn't do. It causes us to pay attention to the chord changes. The harmonic structure is intricate without being showy. Until I broke down the chords, I never realized just how complex this song is. Perfect. Addition by subtraction. Like I said earlier about bubblegum pop, the rhythm takes a back seat to the melody and lush vocal harmonies. The form is simple in itself, but complex in what the association do with it. The vocal harmonies are extremely dense and the keyboard solo at the end was a great addition. There are two A-pluses in one song. That is a feat in itself. Again here, the Wrecking Crew play on this song, and the musicianship shows. I love the organ sound on it. But the start in the timber is the stacked vocal. All six members of the association sing, which means they can reproduce these rich harmonies live. Love it, love it, love it. Fluff lyrics about a beautiful sentiment. Like Drops of Jupiter, I kept thinking that I had overrated this song in 2012, until I listened to it. While Drops impressed me from my 2000s list, the association made me fall more and more deeply in love with this song. Never My Love is an Elite Song. On to the top song of the decade, I'm sure you know who's coming. When you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go. Down, down. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so here's my number one song of the 60s. The Beatles, of course. Who did you expect? Acker Bilk? Anyways, I did mention that all songs in the top 10 come from Sgt. Pepper's on. So that automatically makes this the oldest song in the top 10. This is a mashup of two distinct songs fused together by brilliant orchestration. If you remember, I placed John's vocal here at number one on my Best Classic Rock and Vocal Performances episode. On this song, John outshines Paul, but they're both great performances. Start over.
The two root songs are very dissimilar. I will talk more about how they use the orchestration to seal the song together in the form section. But John's song is more interesting than Paul's, but I'm really glad Paul's section is here. One thing that Paul's section accomplishes is it does pick up the tempo in a big way. The Beatles then ride that energy into the last verse. Very well done. The entire song is a treasure. This A plus though is all about the orchestration. These were two disparate songs that could only be brought together by a brilliant use of symphonic instruments. And Ringo actually. Oh, and the way the verses were structured was well done as well. The first two verses tell the same story, but then goes right into the third verse with another scene. That's unusual, but I really like that. And that huge A chord on the piano at the end, oh, man. There was a brilliant build from the basic acoustic guitar and piano intro, adding the bass and drums. But then that crescendo by the orchestra, which they also did at the end of the song, that was a stroke of absolute brilliance. Dateline 1965, Paul McCartney dies in a car crash. MI5, wishing to stave off a worldwide panic, covers up the death and recruits the winner of a Paul lookalike contest to replace him in the Beatles. In this song, John reacts to Paul's Oh, okay, so maybe Daniel Life is not cryptid evidence of Paul's untimely death. But this is another song with good lyrics pushed up a notch by the context within the album. It is the resumption of the humdrum life after the show is over. The Beatles had high points throughout their all too short run, but Sgt. Pepper saw them at the height of their powers. This was not my favorite album, but it was also during this time that they recorded. Uh, Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields, and All You Need Is Love. What kind of album would that have been? They had learned lessons from Rubber Soul and Revolver and had not yet outgrown each other. But A Day in the Life tops the list as a perfect song and song of the decade. As I said before, the next episode will be to shuffle the existing reviews into the new grading system. Then the one after that will be my longest album ranked to date. In fact, this artist is still putting out records. I calculated that if I were to do my usual 250 word reviews for each album, there would be enough words to fill a 20 page book. Reading the reviews alone would take over an hour. Well, as I've just explained, that my next episode may take some time and cuts might need to be shortened. Anyways, if you liked the episode, mash it. Thumbs up icon below. If you want to see more Moser, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And that, especially for that distant far off day, I'm going to put up my next album rank. And if I'm noxious, no just tell me what a pretentious ass hat I am below. And as always, rock on.
Well, good thing the cut got in before that. Uh, well, it's it recording still. Then. What was that? Well, it's shut it off. It, it's done better. Uh,